Hello and welcome to the November 2022 online Emmaus presentation. I am Deacon Winton DeRosa, and I have been honored to be here to present this month's edition of A Surge of the Heart. Our topic this month is the fullness of time, Jesus and prayer. The title Fullness and Time highlights two essential facts. Jesus came into a specific time for a specific reason. He came into a people and a culture that had been building toward this very moment. Jesus fulfilled what had come before and all the things forever have been changed since he arrived. But before we go further, let's quickly remember what we talked about last month. Last month, we started by defining what prayer is. According to the Catechism, prayer is the raising of one's mind and heart to God and the requesting of good things from God. This raising of our mind and our heart to God requesting good things from God. God knows what is good for us. We discussed that true prayer comes from the heart and that humanity is drawn toward prayer. Why is humanity drawn toward prayer? Because we were created for a relationship with God. That's why we exist, to be in relationship with God. From there, we talked about prayer in salvation history, focusing on prayer in the Old Testament. We explored what we can learn from the different Old Testament figures about prayer and how the prayer of the people of God developed, especially with the building of the temple. We ended up discussing how, while the temple promoted many wonderful practices of prayer, such as the offerings that were made, the feasts that were celebrated, and the pilgrimage that were taken, all this external worship could distract the Jewish people from true prayer of the heart. All of this is important to keep in mind as we consider our topic of Jesus and prayer, because this is the world and the community that Jesus was born into. Jesus was born into a praying community. The Catechism tells us the Son of God who became son of the virgin, learn to pray according to his human heart. He learns the formulas and the rhythms of his mother's prayer. He learns to pray in the words and the rhythm and prayer of his people in the synagogue in Nazareth and in the temple at Jerusalem. But his prayer springs from an otherwise secret source. As he intimates at the age of 12, I must be in my father's house. Here, the newness of prayer in the fullness of time begins to be revealed. Welcome back. It's time to take a deeper look into the topic of Jesus and prayer. We're blessed in that we can learn about prayer from, from Jesus in two ways. First, we can learn about prayer from watching Jesus pray or hearing the stories of how Jesus prayed. We also can learn about prayer from Jesus' teachings on prayer, how he taught his disciples to pray. To begin, we're going to consider some of the key things we learn about prayer from watching Jesus pray. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, we read, He was praying in a certain place, and when he had ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. The Catechism continues saying, in seeing the master at prayer, the disciples of Jesus also want to pray. Watching Jesus pray was so compelling, his disciples requested that he teach them how to pray. Let's put ourselves in the shoes of that disciple as we move forward. Let us ask, Lord, teach me to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. We're going to explore three key things that we learn from watching Jesus pray. Jesus prays before decisive moments. Before decisive moments in his life and his ministry, Jesus goes into prayer. The Catechism states, Jesus prays before the decisive moments of his mission. 
before his father's witness to him during his baptism and his transfiguration, and before his own fulfillment of the father's plan of love by his passion. He also prays before the decisive moments involving the mission of his apostles at the election of the, and the call of the twelve, before, before Peter's confession of him as the Christ of God, and again, that the faith of the chief of the apostles, Peter, may not fail when tempted. Jesus prays before decisive moments. The Catechism reminds us of a number of these moments culminating with Christ's intense prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before his passion. Before we go into that, we're going to look more, more closely at a subtler example, one that we could almost miss. The beginning of Luke 6 tells us this. In those days, he departed to the mountain to pray, and he spent the night in prayer to God. When day came, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose twelve, who he also named apostles. Before Jesus selected his apostles, he spent the night in prayer. He spent the whole night in prayer. Keep this verse in mind because we'll come back to it in a minute. But for now, I want to focus on this truth. We too, we too are called and encouraged to pray before decisive moments in our lives. And as I, as I thought about this truth about prayer, it reminded me of a decisive moment in my own life. There are many times, many decisive moments in our lives, but this one came to my mind. This was my call to ordination. I was about to become a deacon, or I was on my way to becoming a deacon, and this was the time of discerning a vocation. And I had difficulty making the decision solely on my feelings and on my own thoughts. One day, I would feel really good about what it was that I was working my way towards. And the next day, I would be really down and I'd say, I'm, I, this is just not for me. I just don't know what I'm doing. I had a major decision to make. And I had to get my, myself, my ego out of the way or it, it was never going to happen. I was always going to be frustrated. So I, I, I went before, before God in prayer. My prayer was, Lord, if my becoming a deacon is your will for my life, open for me the doors of that path. If it is not your will for me, if you don't want me to become a deacon, close those doors, block the way. Well, you can probably figure out how that worked. But you know, there was a peace in knowing that God had desired this to happen in my life. And that I trusted that God would do what was right for me. So from watching, from watching Jesus pray, we learn. We learn that Jesus prays at decisive moments and he also calls us to do the same thing. Jesus also goes into solitude when he prays. The Catechism says, Jesus often draws apart to pray in solitude on a mountain, preferably at night. Let's revisit Luke 6 for a moment. It says, In those days he departed to the mountain to pray, and he spent the night in prayer to God. When day came, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose twelve whom he also named apostles. Not only did Jesus pray before decisive moments, but he went into solitude to pray. Obviously, this, this talk is on fire because the fire engines are rolling by at the moment, as you can probably hear. Jesus went into solitude when he prayed. Now, obviously, there is great worth in our coming together in communal prayer. It, it is good and necessary to pray with our spouses, with our families, and to come together and to pray together as a people of God. But none of that can be a substitute 
for our developing our own personal relationship with God and speaking with the Lord in prayer on our own. Long before I became a deacon, I developed a way of praying. I would often get up very early in the morning, often, most often before sunrise, and I would go to a place of solitude in my home where it was quiet and there would, I would sometimes read from the Bible and I, I'd think about the words that I was reading and what they meant to me, how God was speaking to me. Often I would kneel face down on the floor before our crucifix and I would literally cover myself completely with a blanket. So here I am lying on the floor, face down, hands and knees, covered over with a blanket. And I'd have this sense of seclusion from the world. This was for me the equivalent of re-entering the womb, a place of safety and warmth. And there I would pray. There I could sense the love of God envelop me. And it was there that I entered into a personal friendship with God. It was from watching Jesus pray that we learned that Jesus prays before decisive moments and that Jesus goes into solitude to pray. Lastly, Jesus' prayer is characterized by thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is a starting place for all of Jesus' prayers. He begins by praising the Father. Now, certainly, many of Jesus' prayers included petitions where Jesus asks something of the Father. But even these prayers are surrounded by thanksgiving. Even before a petition is granted, he is thanks his Father, Heavenly Father. He thanks his Heavenly Father because, as the Catechism said, the giver is more precious than the gift. Jesus knew that his Father was the great giver of, of gifts and that no matter what Jesus asked for, his Father was greater than the gift that he was about to give him. So he always honored and thanked his Father for everything. The giver is more precious than the gift. Once again, we're called to model ourselves after our Lord and place thanksgiving at the center of our prayers. Now that we've considered what we learn about prayer, prayer from Jesus' example, let's explore what Jesus actually taught his disciples about prayer. As a catechism declares, when Jesus prays, he is already teaching us how to pray. But the gospel also gives us Jesus' explicit teaching on prayer. Like a wise teacher, he takes hold of us where we are and leads us progressively toward the Father. So he takes us right from where we are and leads us further on and closer to the Father. Addressing the crowds following him, Jesus builds on what they already know about, about prayer from the Old Covenant and opens to them the newness of the coming kingdom. Then he reveals the newness to them in parables. Finally, he will speak openly of the Father and the Holy Spirit to his disciples, who will be the teachers of prayer in his church. The Catechism identifies three main facets of Jesus' teachings on prayer. Our Family of Faith curriculum books call these the keys of prayer. And these keys are conversion, faith, and watchfulness. Conversion, faith, and watchfulness. Now regarding conversion, the Catechism says, from the Sermon on the Mount onwards, Jesus insists on the conversion of the heart. He insists on a reconciliation with one's brother before presenting an offering to the altar he insists on the love of enemies and prayer for persecutors. He insists on a prayer to the Father in secret, not heaping up empty phrases, prayerfully forgiving from the depths of our heart and having a purity of heart. 
He insists on seeking the kingdom of God before all else. As discussed last month, Jesus affirms that prayer comes from the heart. Our prayer comes from the heart, and his teachings on prayer challenge us to seek a conversion of the heart as the starting place for our prayer. My conversion of heart, so to speak, came when I realized how poorly, how poorly I dealt with conflict and hurt in my own life. My reactions to being dissed, so to speak, how I had found a conflict with somebody, my reaction to this was always fed by anger and a sense of injustice that had to be fixed. And I had to be the one to take care of it. I had to be the one to fix it. Well, this ended up oftentimes in failure and even greater alienation. It got so bad that I deemed it better to say nothing than to try to resolve it. But this didn't work either, as the anger and the hurt never went away. It always got worse. I came to realize that if I were to overcome this, I would have to somehow let go of this anger, let go of this hurt, this frustration. And I knew that I couldn't do it alone. I had to start with prayer. I had to settle my heart in prayer first and ask God that I might find love in my heart for this person who has offended me. My prayer of conversion was, let it not be an anger that I speak. Let it be out of love that this relationship may heal. I have to learn to love the person before I can even talk to them or else it'll be a mess. My faith grew that day. You see, it took a lot of determination to begin to pray for conversion of my own heart. This desire for conversion of heart has become for me an everyday decision, something that has to be done with every instance where I have taken it personal when someone has offended me. I'm sure none of you deal with this. Catechism tells us, once committed to conversion, the heart learns to pray in faith. It learns to believe, to let go, and to know that God has a better plan for us. In Hebrews 11.1, 1, we learn that faith and confidence Faith is confidence in what we hope for and the assurance of what we do not yet see. Jesus instructs us to pray with confidence and trust to God. This doesn't mean that we believe all of our prayers will be answered as we see fit, but instead that we hold tight to the belief that God hears our prayers and that he will answer them according to his will. And what is God's will? God wills the very best for us. He wills for what is he knows is good for us. Finally, we read, in Jesus, the kingdom of God is at hand. He calls his hearers to conversion of faith, but also to watchfulness. In prayer, the disciples keep watch attentive to him who is, and him who is to come in memory of his first coming in the lowliness in the flesh and in that hope of his second coming in glory. In communion with their master, the disciples' prayer is a battle. Only by keeping watch and prayer can they avoid falling into temptation. Jesus' teachings give us these three powerful keys to prayer, conversion, faith, and watchfulness. As you've seen, there's much more that we can learn from our Lord about prayer, but truly the most important thing we learn about prayer from Jesus hasn't even been mentioned yet. And we learn this truth both from Jesus' example and from his teachings. It's what we call filial prayer. From Jesus and because of Jesus, 
we know that God is our Father, that we can go to him in prayer as his beloved children. We, like our Lord, can call God Abba or, or Daddy because we are now in a relationship with him, one that we know that he loves us and that we can love him in return. This truth is the newness of prayer that Jesus revealed in the fullness of time, that we are children of the Father. To wrap up our time together today, I'd like to talk about some of the ways that we can incorporate Jesus into our prayers. To begin, let's talk about the practice of praying in Jesus' name. Catechism tells us when Jesus openly entrusts to his disciples the mystery of prayer to the Father, he reveals to them what their prayer and our prayer must be once he is returned to the Father in his glorified humanity. What is new is to ask in his name, to ask in Jesus' name. Faith in the Son introduces the disciples into the knowledge of the Father because Jesus is the way, that Jesus is the truth, and Jesus is the life. The practice of praying in Jesus' name is really quite simple, but it can take some practice before it becomes a habit. I regu I'm regularly reminded that prayer begins to the Father and concludes with asking all of this in the name of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. This has taken a long time to sink into my brain. It's, it starts with, you know, something as simple as a prayer before meal. Bless us, O Lord. In other words, we're praying to God, thanking him for the gifts that we are about to receive. Through Christ our Lord, amen. So this is that prayer that, the, that the, actually the church uses many times as its form of prayer, and starting with prayer to the Father and concluding through the Son. Many of our prayers at Mass begin and end with that formula of prayer, Almighty, ever-living God, addressing our prayer to God the Father in a petition of prayer. And when the petition is concluded, we end the prayer with, through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns forever. We pray to God through his Son. We pray in the name of Jesus. Why do we do that? Because Jesus asked us to. He asked us to pray in his name. In addition to praying in Jesus' name, as most of us probably know, we are also invited to pray to Jesus directly. Throughout the scriptures, we see countless examples of individuals praying to Jesus. The Catechism declares, prayer to Jesus is answered by him already during his ministry. As Jesus hears the prayers of faith expressed in words through, through, through the leper, where he says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Or Jairus, where he says, my daughter is at the point of death. Please come, lay your hands on her that, that she may be well and live. Or the Canaanite woman who said, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. Or the example of the good thief who was crucified next to Jesus. And he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Or in silence, the bearers of the paralytic who lowered their friend through the roof of the house to have Jesus touch him, to pray for him. The tears and the ointment of the sinful woman. Or the woman who had the hemorrhage who touched his clothes. And she says, all I have to do, she prayed, all I have to do is touch the hem of his clothing and I will be healed. The urgent requests of the blind men, have mercy on us, son of David. Or Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, have been renewed in the traditional prayer to Jesus known as the Jesus prayer. The Jesus prayer is, Lord Jesus Christ, son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Healing infirmities or forgiving sins, Jesus always responds 
to a prayer offered in faith. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. You see, Jesus is not simply a wonderful model. He's not just a good man. He's not just a teacher of prayer. Jesus is God. Jesus, it's God, and it's He we can offer our prayers to. Catechism continues sharing that St. Augustine wonderfully summarizes these three dimensions of Jesus' prayer. He, Jesus, prays for us as our priest. Jesus prays in us as our head. And Jesus is prayed to by us as our God. Therefore, let us acknowledge our voice in him and his voice in us. Let us pray. May Almighty God bless us as we continue our journey of faith through that surge of a heart. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son who lives with reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen.